Hey guys, welcome to the Think Tank. I have Shil Saket again. Hi Shil, welcome again. So as you know, Shil, yeah. Thanks Shil for joining. So as you know, Shil is a senior manager with one of the fintech giants and thanks Shil for coming back again on the podcast. Yep, thank you Angad. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. So the the agenda of today's podcast is defining intelligence how can we define intelligence and then we will also try to discuss neural networks uh, symbolic ai we will also try to cover turing test and then we always take the benchmark of humans uh, once we try to discuss intelligence so we will also try to see how we can discuss the other species or other modes of intelligence as well so that we get that humility that we are not the only intelligent species uh, in this universe uh, so so starting with shield what is intelligence so can you define intelligence in your own words so what is intelligence as per you okay uh, so like not going by the bookish definition uh, like we all have seen that movie three idiots right where uh, amir khan was asked to define machine and he gave like a very simple explanation so i'll try to do that i don't want to go into the bookish definition so i would say like uh, intelligence is like let's say an ability to learn uh solve real life problems uh you know and adapt to new situations and you know basically uh, keep improving and you know gathering more data and basically uh, you know learning from Uh, the end like like if you tl- if you talk about uh, you know organisms like uh, human beings and other animals uh, the in- intelligence will be like you know self learning right like you can learn and and make decisions so that's what intelligence i think like if you can put it down very uh, in very simple words that would be intelligence and uh, you have been like we all uh, basically you know uh, in the world of ai right like right now the the everywhere we are hearing ai chat gpt and all these new uh you know uh, things that have come up so in today's world like artificial intelligence is exactly the same thing right it's it's trying to catch up to the biological intelligence that we already inherit because of our evolution so artificial intelligence is all is basically uh, you know a machine trying to uh, make decisions intelligent decisions uh, based on uh, input parameters which can be like you know images or or text data or numeric data to make decisions so that's basically uh, what intelligence mean uh, it's definitely not uh, equal to uh, you know consciousness or something it's just the ability to make a decision so we do, we don't want to make it more grander uh, than like you know make it more you know similar to like a consciousness but uh, in plain words i would just say intelligence is just to you know ability to make decisions and 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 gather more information and you know keep learning and yeah. um, one of the strange thing is that machine or ai when makes a decision it has a mm-hmm. lot of data behind the scenes and also yep. now there is a concept of one shot learning two shot learning so mm-hmm. we can give some feedback quick feedback uh, mm-hmm. to the machine um, but humans right like even if there is no data just based on the situation uh, like if imagine if i don't know history about something i'm mm-hmm. just given something new totally fresh right uh, my neural mm-hmm. network or my biological neural network can still at least make some decision now that decision yes. may not be based on uh, any judgments it can be wrong or right mm-hmm. but yeah the, the and you AI... can correct yourself by the feedback you get from your environment like right so uh, you might have some certain basic intelligence Uh, and you are now exposed to a completely new scenario right for example if you don't know how to swim and you jump into a pool uh, you might do certain basic things that you are basically doing uh, you know as a, as a reflex and that's programmed in you but uh, you know a feedback would be like you look at other people and then you try to mimic them and then you kind of do something to float right so maybe something like that right? yeah that's yeah. that's a great point so imagine mm-hmm. human intelligence is a base neural network which is not the mm-hmm. which is not trained right now right it's it's yeah. totally fresh and mm-hmm. 
once it is trained on the environments once the society gives mm-hmm. the feedback that you have to sit like this you have to talk like this you have to wear like this <laughs> you have to deal like this we continuously mm-hmm. pre train like we continuously train our neural net our base neural exactly. network right yeah yeah that's and, and the best training. thing is yeah and the best thing is like uh, when you observe kids right they are touching things they are uh, they are exploring everything because they are trying to learn and based on what they do and how we react they learn uh, you know what is a good thing to do what is something that they shouldn't be doing so and they have, that's why kids are very you know creative and they want to basically explore they are very uh, uh, curious i would say you know because they don't know the outcome of a lot of things right so that's why they're just doing everything and then when we give like as parents or uh, you know guardians we give them feedback or friends we give them feedback then they start learning like you know yeah. they start tagging like one, this is one, red color yeah one uh, humor humorous way or comic way to define is sometimes mm-hmm. adults can have lot of garbage training on their base neural yeah. network so that they don't want to adapt <laughs> or don't want to change but children as yeah. they are very fresh their base neural network is very fresh they are happy to change they are happy to adapt they are happy to learn new things mm-hmm. uh, i think that's a great way to put that Uh, also she'll talk about emotional intelligence right like taking decision yeah. is of course one form of intelligence uh, mm-hmm. but intelligence is a, a wide spectrum i always say that yeah. we can't and as you said like uh, there can't be a bookish definition of intelligence mm-hmm. um, so how you think emotional intelligence also play a role uh, typically in human society and how uh ai can catch up to it yeah so emotional intelligence uh, right now i would say uh, machines don't uh, they, they won't be able to uh, you know uh, face that kind of a situation right because they don't so basically humans right like we humans live in a society we live in a, in groups right and then there is uh there are different expectations from people and there are so many outcomes of what you do you might do something which you believe is correct based on what you have experienced but it might not be correct for the society or uh you know you are supposed to react in certain in a certain way uh when uh, you know a lot of pressure is uh basically like you 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 are in a, a very high pressure situation you cannot break down or you cannot like you know uh, increase your voice so these kind of things happen which i don't think um machines will have to deal with right in the current situation because they are a very com- machine intelligence right artificial intelligence is a very different thing and 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 we were as we were already talking about intelligence right so intelligence what we discussed like what machines are trying to mimic is just the decision making part they don't have to uh, the only thing that they are trained on is whether the decision is correct or not right yeah. that's what the 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 loss function is right like how accurate we are and and all yeah. those things they are uh, basically right but we have to add extra layers on top of it right if i think this is correct then is it correct me for me to react in a certain way that also comes on top of it right and and that is very important especially now uh, for humans like for all of us like we're working in different fields uh, emotional intelligence becomes very important because today we are exposed to so many things a lot of information is out there i would say a lot of misinformation is also out there so in a in a way like you know you have to basically uh, have control over your own uh, emotions and train yourself basically to deal with certain urges and and rushes in uh, in your in your body right in your mind that you know if you do something and you get a feedback that feedback handling is very important right that that yeah. uh, you know machines don't have to deal with so we have to deal with the feedback like how the society reacts right so and those things are also very, right like yes yeah, yeah. so exactly so these are the extra uh, parameters that we have to deal with machines don't have to deal right because they don't they have no perception of the society right so they they just live in a box somewhere in a data center or something uh, or you know <laughs> somewhere like and and they don't care about the society they don't interact they don't have like a you know conversation with each other as of now that's what yeah. uh, you know we believe in but yeah emotional intelligence has become very important these days uh, mental health 
uh, these things uh, were very much ignored initially, but I think with a lot of information uh, that has been provided through internet to people, you know, people are getting aware of it. Um, so I think uh, emotional intelligence today is as equal as any other thing, um, and it I, I I believe it should be a part of the you know children's curriculum in the schools and uh, a part of like a formal education as well. I, I guess they are it's being added. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, this is a very important topic and, and we should all take it up very, uh, you know, yeah. uh, it, it should be very so, important for all of us. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go to the mm -hmm. beginning, right? Like when AI as a field was created back when Alan mm -hmm. Turing um, and then uh, the word AI was coined, um, like what was Turing test? How Turing thought initially in those days uh, about intelligence? Okay, uh, I'll just take a step back and go back to the point where artificial intelligence or why machines uh, started uh, taking over a lot of tasks. So uh, obviously, like as industrialization hit, we all realized as a society that, uh, you know, before that, everything was driven by human muscle, right? Uh, we were doing everything by our own hands and they were basic machines. But as, in, you know, as the society started to industrialize, we started depending on machines because they were more efficient and they uh, were more reliable and more accurate and can do things at scale, right? So we had like big machines, but, uh, you know, they could do like the mechanical work. But what about making some decisions, right? Like what if, for example, in World War, right? Like how can you, uh, when the World War was going on at that time, can we use uh, certain computers? So that's where the computers came in, right? Like, uh, especially, you know, the revolution came in with the digital computers, not the analog computers before that, because they were also mechanical. So once we moved into the digital computing world, uh, we were able to uh, gather more information. And what the next step was to, you know, can we make a decision out of it? Like, is this frequency uh, of conversation going on between, uh, you know, the enemy camp? Like, can we detect certain, uh, like, you know, can we identify the pattern? If they might be using certain, uh, you know, codes, can we detect those codes and identify their intent? So these things started coming up, especially at that time. And there was like a huge investment on, you know, creating something uh, like an intelligent machine. Right. At that time, I think that's where, uh, you know, around that time only like Turing test, right? Like you talked about, I think Alan Turing would design this test was basically uh, this again by the name, you know, uh, if as the name suggests, right, it's a test. Uh, and the test is basically uh, on the machine and how the test is performed is like you have like a human which is communicating with another entity and it's not disclosed to the human that that entity is a machine or another human and they're having conversation and that conversation if the human cannot detect that the other entity is a machine or things like the other entity is a human that the machine then the machine passes that turing test so uh, i think in a nutshell like that's what uh, turing yeah. test is all about yeah yeah thanks she like it's super helpful right like for our viewers how can uh, how we evolved as a society, like you mentioned, industrial revolution, mm -hmm. assembly lines, um, it mm -hmm. started with automation, some kind of automation. And then uh, we were in the world of analog, digital, and then how Alan Turing, like the Enigma situation uh, in World War II, how that code was broken. And then mm -hmm. uh, I think that that actually helps the, the new or young population to understand how we have come mm -hmm. so far. Uh, and, and this uh, discussion. So while we have covered Turing test, can you also help us with, um, like after Turing test, most of the uh, AI work was symbolic AI, right? Like even Turing mm -hmm. test was more rule based. It was not neural network based, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So how it again evolved from symbolic AI to neural networks and what is neural network? Okay, yeah. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, question, actually. So when you look at like how intelligence was, artificial intelligence was evolving, uh, initially the perception was it is just like a huge hard-coded if and else, uh, you know, situation. If you see something like this, do this, and it was very hard-coded. So if I today write a code, which is just if and else, it will be like, 
millions and millions of lines of code because there's so much variability the they will be nested if and else con, you know uh, uh, condition so that was very initial uh, form of the you know machine intelligence at that time and that's what uh, we call as like a hard coded ai a hard coded intelligence or symbolic intelligence because at that time symbolic intelligence by the name you know it suggests that uh, there are symbols that the machines would take and then there is a hard coded feedback that if you get something like this then do this right so these kind of uh, uh, things were there and that was not uh, sustainable because it had to be maintained and updated it doesn't have the ability to adapt and if you go back to the conversation we had initially right like what is intelligence intelligence is not about just making a decision but it's also about how can we adapt to the new situation how can the machine adapt to a new uh, data that came in right so if and else symbolic ai completely failed in those things it i mean it not it's uh, it didn't fail because but it basically couldn't update itself right it cannot make a wild guess or for a new data but that's where machine learning came in and i would say a uh, neural network came a little bit later but it was at the same time like it was developing the actually the first neural network was i think a perceptron right like the first single layer uh, neural network i think it was around 1950s uh, so definitely there was some kind of work going on but initially when we moved from uh, you know symbolic ai to you know a, 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 an algorithm that you know a, a mathematical algorithm which would uh, you know surpass the symbolic ai uh, and basically treat data as pattern and and it's basically a pattern recognition model right so it would uh, for example if you are so there are different types of machine learning algorithms like let, if you are talking about classification right so if a new data comes in can i classify it as something right so it's basically if you look at the graph it's basically forming certain regions in the in a graph and if a data falls in that region it basically predicts that this is this is a um, this is you know x or y uh, uh, category right so that's where initially and and at that time you know the data size was also not huge um because you know as the machine learning was progressing even uh you know uh, computation power and data gathering was also increasing so it was very initial uh, in the very initial stage uh where we didn't have like enough processing power and not enough data so at that time these machine learning models which we now call them as classical machine learning models uh, because machine learning again is like a very big uh, yeah. uh, you know field and under that you have like uh, classical machine learning and then neural networks and so so many things under uh, deep learning right everything is under the same umbrella so the classical machine learning algorithms was for example random forest we we keep hearing about all these things right logistic regressions so they were very good at uh, predicting new data so it kind of solved the problem that symbolic ai was facing it was able to predict new data adapt to new situations right if you give like a random data it will still be able to predict with a certain uh, level of accuracy and probability right yeah. so it will do that but again uh, then you know then suddenly there was a as uh, the computers become uh, started becoming more uh, you know like a household thing people started using it more and more the more amount of data and then with the uh, you know uh discuss, like invention of internet right like uh, if we all got connected and the uh, sharing of data started uh, increasing exponentially that's where a huge amount of data was generated and it was observed that these classical machine learning models uh, they actually they still exist today because we still are using all of them but it was observed that uh, they were performing really well up to a certain uh, you know amount of data but after that amount of data if you increase that threshold the training is, is very uh, difficult because it takes a lot of time to train because there's so many data it's very difficult to find a pattern and then second uh, um, i think uh, the training and the accuracy also decreased right so at that time it was uh, again we already if you think about the timeline the you know neural network is also getting um, improved with you know every passing year but it never saw the the level of uh, importance that classical machine learning algorithms were were seeing because it never had the huge amount of data at that time and if you compare a classical machine learning algorithm with a neural network classical machine learning algorithms will perform better than neural networks 
below a certain data site, set yeah. size. So once that base threshold was crossed, it was observed that neural networks were performing better. And that started, I think, early 2000. That's where, uh, you know, deep learning uh, became a major field of uh, research. A lot of people started using neural networks. And again, neural network is nothing but uh, it's trying to mimic how our brain makes decision using artificial neurons. A neuron is basically, artificial neuron is basically a, a mathematical uh, version of a biological neuron that we have in our brain. So if you actually, you know, uh, see the photo, you know, the photograph of both of them, or, uh, you know, it'll be exact, it looks very similar to each other. Yeah. So that's what it is doing. And and then suddenly like, you know, huge data and yeah. huge computing power, they all uh, basically triggered the, the growth of neural networks. And today we are yeah, you you, know, much you further a ahead. great yeah. point, Sheel. Like mm -hmm. you, not, you don't need to use neural network every time, right? Like, See yes. your use case, see the business case, see the amount of data you have, and even something like logic exactly. regression, uh, something like decision trees, random forests, uh, can solve few of the things for you uh, in a better way, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's that's a great point. And uh, can you also define like uh, now you you discussed about neuron, right? So neuron is basically uh, just something which is holding a number, right? Um, so yes. Holding zero or one. Um, mm -hmm. So can you just define uh, a neural network, right? Like just a very high level architecture. Uh, mm -hmm. And we don't need to go in deep, but just for the audience to understand, uh, because audience normally, pe when, when we talk about neural network, right? People think mm -hmm. it is a fiction. Uh, because what happens is you, you gave something yeah. yeah you gave something to chat gpt there is some magic power and the chat gpt is answering you back right that's that's how the common person thinks so how those neurons right um, mm -hmm. basically take those numbers in uh, kind of and then you have those layers activation functions weights mm -hmm. uh, so if you can just very very basic uh, if you can just bring up some building blocks of neural network yeah, sure. Uh, I would, I mean, it's a very difficult job to summarize neural network uh, in a very simple language, but I'll, tr uh, you know, try. I hope my attempt is good, but I would just say, you know, let's take a very simple example. One layer uh, neural network, right? Oh, sorry, single layer perceptron. Uh, you can use that uh, term. So there are three layers, right? And it'll help if you bring up the, the image yeah. of a single layer, uh, neural network. So there is like an input uh, layer, then there is like a hidden layer, and then there is an output layer. I'm just looking, just a very basic example, right? So input layer is basically where you send an input, which can be any type of a data. For example, if you are using uh, it to predict, uh, let's say, text data as, let's say, you know, what type of language is this piece of text, right? So let's say if I write something in English, it goes into and basically, but the text is becomes a little bit complicated because you have to embed them into again numerical example. But for now, uh, okay, let's ignore that. Okay, let's let's take an example of uh, uh, let's say predicting a house price. Okay, so everything is numerical now. Let's say how many uh, bedrooms are there in your house? What floor that apartment uh, you know uh, flat is? Right, these are the different parameters. What is the square footage? So you take all this information. What is the locality? How far is it from, uh, you know, let's say a nearest metro station? And so many data all you can get features. for a particular. All the features you get, and then you feed into a neural network input uh, layer. That input layer is connected to a uh, hidden layer, and you know all the nodes are interconnected with each other, right? And uh, the and then but the node the connection of the nodes are also not equal, right? They are, the strength is different, right? And that's what we call as weights. So maybe one node is connected to another node and the weight is really high, but it is the weight of the input layer to the second new, uh, you know, neuron of the uh, hidden layer, the weight will be less, so the strength is less. So if you send the information, uh, the different types of, uh, you know, numerical uh, representation get forwarded, right? So that's basically a feed forward. Uh, neural network. You send an information from input layer, it's getting multiplied with the weights, 
but again you might have like a huge number of neurons in your hidden there right so how will the model decide that what all information it doesn't want to overfit right it wants to penalize certain numbers right so that's what activation function is doing activation function is basically activating or deactivating a neuron right so there are different types of activation functions like relu uh, i think i'm sigmoid, just forgetting a couple of, sigmoid yeah so there are so many yeah. activation functions they just try to give like a activation or deactivation uh, you know th- uh, so basically if a number is let's say less than 0 like, so you won't get the zero and yeah. one kind of think of it like a barrier right so barrier, it, yeah. the, it's like if you're crossing a road it it opens the barrier for certain types of vehicles and doesn't open it yeah. for certain types of vehicles. so it basically acts as that barrier and then only those neurons that have an act, get activated send their output uh, their output to the output layer which is the third layer and that's where output layer gives like a prediction that oh this particular uh, you know house the price should be around uh, 5 crores right but if you change certain features it would go down to let's say 50 lakhs so yeah so that's what in a nutshell i would define as an uh, no, as a, a as a neural network yeah. that's a great example like you feed some some of the features mm-hmm. some of the dimensions and the dimensions on which you want to get prediction you see um, and then um, based on the training and test results you fine tune those knobs of activation yeah. functions yeah. rates uh, and biases so that mm-hmm. you get a, a good result with a good accuracy and then you can say mm-hmm. that okay my neural network is doing great right and then yeah. once you have trained that neural network other people can also use that right like yeah you actually uh, i actually uh, forgot about that point that it, it's not always forward it goes back which yeah, is called the, back the propagation, back propagation part. because yeah. once it goes forward it says yeah. it's it should be 5 crores but yeah. the actual price was 2 crores so it goes back readjusts its weight comes back again with a new yeah. so it's basically going back and forth and uh, trying to adjust the weights and those weights are basically your model yeah right so even if you have like a pre trained model uh, if i get the weights i know the architecture i can basically load that model uh, because it's all the the whole uh, what you said right like the the black box thing is just the weight so if i get the weights of a neural network you basically can replicate it and and start getting the predictions exactly like mm-hmm. for the audience here it's not the black box but it's basically mm-hmm. uh, calculus behind the scenes or mathematics behind yeah. the scene um where gradient descent and cost function and there are a number of uh concepts which are involved uh through which you um, you you create such kind of neural network uh so thank you so much shil i think uh, that really helps and uh, can you also help like which are the different types of neural network right um yeah so that uh, the audience will understand okay now we know what is a neural network uh it's uh it's it's something where we are replicating biological neural network um uh, and it's kind of having layers to start with and then there is an input uh, there are features that are coming in from input and then we, you are getting some output and those layers are doing some kind of magic right like uh, but mm-hmm. uh, what are the various kinds of neural network and uh, where all we typically use those uh, neural networks yeah so again uh, neural network Uh, it's all about how you design the architecture right so if you have multiple layers it will be called as a multi multi layer perceptron or a artificial neural network basically you can say that you know, there are multiple layers hidden layers uh, there will always going to be an input layer and an output layer but it's just how you are basically designing the internal architecture is or overall architecture let's say if you are using multiple uh, sequential inputs that's called like a recurrent neural network because you're using sequential data that's we use that uh, a lot in in natural language processing to identify uh, you know for machine translation and so many things we can do that encoding decoding uh convolution neural network is another type of a neural network which is being uh, which basically ha- finds more um, use cases in image recognition so it is basically designed in certain way that it takes input data as images which is again like a two dimensional uh, data an image is nothing but like 
uh, let's say if you have like a black and white photograph, it's just like a, a two dimensional matrix of uh, gray scale, right? It will be having numbers of, uh, you know, how, how black or gray a particular um, pixel is, right? Yeah. So it takes, it has the ability to take that information, process it, there are multiple layers in, uh, inside that, you know, pooling and all those things, you can use that and then make a prediction. So convolution neural network is also there. Uh, uh, I talked about tracker and neural network, artificial neural network, yeah. multi-layer perceptron. So these are the very high level exactly. neural networks. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And uh, now we like, there were mm -hmm. like, now we are into an age of large language models, right? Mm -hmm. Where we yeah. are saying that RNNs also have like RNNs were quite famous till 2017, 18, right? Like, yes. um, we, we loved RNNs and we loved the mathematics behind it. But now, um, mm. with, with the, uh, with the evolution, uh, specifically related to attention related, uh, models mm -hmm. and large language models, right? We, we are still saying that, um, the, the large language model, uh, which is kind of more pre-trained model, uh, is mm -hmm. is also uh, taking some of those uh, cons of RNNs into account uh, and giving more better results. Yes. Yeah, yeah I think uh, you know you brought up a very important point, like 2017, post 2017, like the world of AI saw a huge shift uh, with respect to different types of models coming. You, you talked about attention then transformers basically these type of architecture came in which were able to take and and language model i would say is more concerned about um, natural language processing so there are different types of architecture language model are uh, models that are basically trained to understand the the human language so uh, as we all know right like human language was the most difficult missing piece uh, in the uh, you know evolution of ai right we were able to perfect yeah. uh, image recognition, uh, we were able to affect other types of uh, machine learning challenges, but human language was the yeah. most difficult thing to crack. And, and that basically, you know, uh, saw a lot of uh, improvement after 2017 when the transformers were developed. And, and since then you have seen like, you know, large language models uh, being trained and, and the benefit of those language models is like they are pre, they can be used without any training at your end, you can just, you know, download them from certain open source platforms and then you can just load it and start using it for your training. You can use it to generate embeddings for your use cases. So you can, you don't have to train those models again. And then using those embeddings, you can then further train your own use cases. So that kind of changed the whole, uh, whole scenario. Initially, I remember we were using um, word to vec these kind of models were there initially, uh, global vectors. So you were like, we were, sub, we were basically training them at, at our end. Like we used it like word to vec is basically an unsupervised learning initially, right? Like you can just throw in text and start learning. So I remember back in, I think 2018, I used to train word to vec and word to vec, you have to define a lot of parameters like, you know, window size and so many things. I remember at that time we used to play with it. Uh, I think the size of the vector output was also one of the parameters that do you want your word to vec, uh, you know, output vector size to be, let's say 500 and or 1000. And then you play with those parameters and then you get, let's say uh, a lot of word to vec models and then you find the accuracy. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, work that used to go into that, right? Because you have to start from scratch yeah, and also exactly. the quality of data, is it good or not? How good cleaning you're doing. So now with, um, these language models, I don't have to do that. I can just pull a language model out of the box, uh, generate embeddings for my text. Like for example, you're doing like a cosine similarity. So I can pull like a MPNet transformer model. I can uh, generate embeddings of my text and then I can do like a cosine similarity. So that has become very fast. I can do that in like, uh, let's say 10 minutes if I have the data ready, right? Yeah. So that's basically the efficiency that, I think the efficiency part came in. And I think that actually further accelerated the the, the growth of uh, you know the transformers and the other architectures that because we are building on top of uh, the previous uh, you know learning. Yeah. So, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So the the goal here is just for the audience. Like we 
the what we are trying to do is we are trying to cover the evolution on how um, the 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 world of AI started and where we are right now, right? And of course, Moore's law, uh, as she mentioned, like uh, the, the 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 capacity of our hardwares as well to handle this kind of data uh, is also playing a great role, yeah. like large language models, right? Like we we were never able to have those large language models before 20 years because we were not there, right? So as per Moore's law, every year we our computation power is increasing. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reason that, because the statistics was still there, I would say, uh, even before 20, 25 years. But uh, yeah. we were we were not able to do those practical things because the com computation power was not there. And I, exactly. I just imagine what we can do once the quantum computing uh, or, or those yeah. kind of co computation power will come in. Just uh, like I just get fascinated to see, uh, to, to even visualize what will happen in the future. Um, in, yeah, I, actually to add to that, right? Like when you think of AI, right? AI, I would say is the software, yeah. right? Which lives in a hardware. So an AI will be dependent on the algorithms that you use. So whatever architecture you have developed, but that architecture has an upper limit, which is defined, defined by the hardware. Right. Yeah. So if you increase the computation power and everything, the uh, you know AI will keep on growing. And it has been observed that the rate at which these computation power used to increase is now reducing the rate of uh, improvement is reducing. So it looks like, uh, you know, we are seeing a saturation of the digital era, right? The digital computing is getting saturated and the next leap forward is uh, say quantum computing that will be the third uh, or maybe third the ultimate wave. layer like third analog wave. digital and then uh, quantum the yeah. quantum three wave. so yeah so i think we are going to be there and just imagine like what will the ai do when it gets on a hardware of quantum computing and i think quantum computing is million times uh, you know faster than digital computing so because it's because digital computing is just computing on zeros and ones right but quantum computing is computing on atoms right yeah so that's very very uh you know it's crazy uh i actually uh, read about this like even a leaf which you can see outside can convert uh you know uv rays uh with help of uh, chloroplast into let's say glucose that's also quantum computing so that's very crazy. Like we are surrounded by a lot of uh, things that we take for granted, but to achieve that level of quantum computing, we have to do so many things. And yeah. currently, like the, the the restriction of quantum computing is you cannot you have to bring the the system to uh, zero, you know, all absolute zero, right? Because you want to have the atoms completely at rest. Any little disturbance will completely, you know uh will not give a good result right so we have to bring it down to absolute zero but outside if you look outside right mother nature is doing at room temperature it at room temperature yeah so we are still not there we are still we have to maintain it's a very expensive process to have a quantum computer but eventually i think if that you know improvement kind if it grows uh you know the the, the computing cap capability and technology grows we might achieve it at room temperature and then see like a huge shift in in so many things yeah. and i think you know estimates are there like it might happen in the next 10 years so exactly yeah see. yeah so i think um, the the way uh, people like elon musk are saying that uh, mm -hmm. the ai system will be more intelligent th than the entire humanity right and i yeah. i see that as a truth because uh, once the quantum computers come and imagine like instead of like we now have cloud computing, right? So imagine the infrastructure behind the scene is quantum computing, and we are on a shared. Uh, we 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 are we humans are using those shared computing powers through our PCs, right? We don't need yeah. to throw our legacy PCs, but imagine we can just use those uh, computing power, and we can just visualize. Uh, like our PCs will be more like monitors, just. Uh, <laughs> 
just for visualization okay. visualization yeah so yeah it's crazy yeah. <laughs> yeah so now coming back to more generic topics i know um, so i i just want to give i just want to give emphasis again that uh, this kind of discussion is very important because then you will understand how um, the evolution happened but coming back to more generic discussion like we also have animals and birds right she like uh, yeah. we whenever we talk about intelligence we take humans as a benchmark which i think is more egoistic because we we kind of are egomaniac animals the world animals, revolves around us yeah right the so universe was created that, for us <laughs> yeah we think that the universe is only for us and the world revolves around us but then there are so many birds and animals and so many other species which also have their intelligence so can you also speak on uh, not only human intelligence but the intelligence of other creatures in the nature yeah so uh, again uh, intelligence as you defined is the ability to make decisions and making decision depends completely upon uh, depends upon your environment right so we as humans evolved in a certain uh, different environment where we faced a very different type of situation as com- compared to let's say a blue whale or a or a dolphin or a shark they have like a completely different environment right or even go deeper into the ocean you'll have deep sea animals right it's, they don't even perceive light at that particular in that particular uh, you know environment so in order to make decisions in different types of scenarios your sense organs uh, evolve in certain way and then you basically may, you know use that uh, to to basically survive right and intelligence for animals even for humans is all about is uh, about survival and i think survival is you can call it as a technically as a loss function right for for our we our models are trained to survive so if if something uh, kills us or makes us feel sick or you know uh, uh, has a negative impact on our health and society and everything we don't do that right that's how we train ourselves so um, animals and birds like we I mean, I would not say they are equally important because obviously, uh, the, the, if you talk about intelligence, uh, from all the species that has been discovered till now, like humans are, uh, are supposed to be the most intelligent beings on earth, and it's very evident with the way uh, we are basically taking over uh, all the you know the, all the land masses. I would say not there are you know beings still in 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 the deep sea oceans that we don't. we have not even been there but uh, yeah humans have now achieved the top most position on the food chain so we don't have to worry about being eaten by an animal uh, but uh, there are animals who are very intelligent and their intelligence kind of uh, uh, you know uh, astonishes us sometimes because they might be intelligent in doing a specific thing right like for example i i, I saw this uh, video on youtube like how bees communicated with each other like they cannot use voice to communicate but if you if a bee finds let's say that this particular flower has a good nectar you will see more bees coming in and there was a study that was done on them and it would they what they did was they exposed let's say a good uh, a flower uh, which has very good nectar to one bee and they observed that the bee went back to the hive and they have certain dance so they kind of dance in a certain pattern which is basically communicating the other bees the location of that particular flower wow. and then you will see other bees so that i saw that it was like really mind boggling mind boggling uh, and even i yeah. i saw like in on the similar lines i saw that even like it it's so much fascinating to listen that even the trees and the plants they are having signals yeah. like even the trees yeah i was just going to bring up that topic man yeah. you just uh, <laughs> you yeah. just hijacked my uh, next point but yeah please okay. sorry Go. no no i i just want to hear from you like what are your thoughts on like not only mm-hmm. like of course the animals are having those kind of patterns where the bees work yeah. in community and passes signal to each other or the dolphin catches the signal of earthquake or the birds catch a signal mm-hmm. of um any calamity or catastrophe that is going to happen um, but it's it's just fascinating to see how even the plants right like 
the trees they are uh, they're communicating yeah. yeah and i saw that uh, there was a i think a ted talk video that i saw in which a person like uh, you know a well known scientist i'm forgetting the name uh, he brought two plants and was able to connect them through wires or electrodes and he created some setup and on one side was a plant uh, it, it was a uh, you know a bird eating plant like a fly eating plant not bird sorry so uh, what do you call those i think carnivorous plants right yeah. so they have like small uh, flower kind of an opening yeah. and then the bugs would come in thinking it's like a flower and then sits on it then it just closes yeah. and then that digest that bug right so what happens is inside that particular opening there are certain uh, you know stem like very small uh, things that are coming out of uh, you know the, the plant right very small uh, i would say what what would be the word maybe small uh, secretion things, se- not secretion but there are small uh, stem like very small okay. uh, stems coming out of which are very flexible you can it Got can it. you can brush it and it will move right yeah. it's very sensitive to touch so it's open there and if a fly comes in and sits on it so obviously it will move and it will touch those sensors and that will give the information that something has has sat on its uh, body and then it closes it but it's also computing so if you go there let's say if i want to test it if i go there and if i touch it once it won't close if i touch it twice it won't close only when it you touch it thrice it closes oh, wow. so basically because those plants need to conserve energy right they don't want to close and open on uh, incorrect information right so let's say a bug a bug comes and sits on it it will move and will touch it two to three times then only it will realize that this is basically an, a bug and i want to i have to eat it then then only it closes so so the again the the loss function here is to basically uh, conserve energy right you don't want to open and close more often so it's so if it is counting three or four times so there is some intelligence there that is basically counting so what this guy did was Uh, he further went ahead one step he connected this plant to a touch me not plant so touch me not plants uh, you know uh, ability is that if you touch it, it the leaves yeah. close collapse right yeah. so they, it connected both of these plants so here let's say is a touch me not plant and here is that uh, carnivorous. you know carnivorous plant and on the carnivorous plants receptors this guy touched three times and then in that video you can see that the uh, touch me not plants collapsed so the in the signal was passed from one plant to oh another my God. it kind of gives uh, and it's goosebumps. there it's like i'm not like yeah goosebumps. it gives me goosebumps and i'm not making it up there's like a ted talk you can go and watch it and that yeah. guy gave like a live demonstration so obviously there is some kind of a communication going on again coming back to the intelligence part right an animal or any being and and it's again a theory but uh, uh i mean we can see evidences in up in our uh, you know environment any being uh, ca- any organism cannot become intelligent unless it has the ability to communicate because once you communicate you share, share your experience and the learning basically grows exponential because of different brains um you know different people or different uh, you know animals or organisms communicating with each other sharing their uh, learnings that's why one of the reasons why human became very intelligent was because we are a social being and we communicate we uh, we pass our learnings from one generation to another so the other generation yeah. already has that learning that we have already gathered so that cannot happen i, I saw this example of octopus octopus is a very are very smart right if you give them if you ent- fit them into a into a, a jar it can open the jar it, it, and if you show them that if you turn the uh the cap it will open so it will learn from there and it will turn the cap from inside and open and get out so there are videos where they have yeah. done this test but the yeah. problem with octopuses are that they are not social animals so their learnings die with them right so they are not able to pass it on to others so that's the reason why they are not uh, lo- evolving the intelligence at the rate humans did yeah. so again intelligence exist in all the different types of animals it's just the way uh, they organize their learnings and, and share it with their next generation or communicate it with them is basically what defines the growth yeah. of intelligence maybe in some other planet there will be let's say uh, an octopus which became social and shared the learning and now is dominating the planet so 
it, it is just very it's, accidental. It's funny yeah. to see an analogy uh, where, let's say, Chat GPT is learning from Google Bard, and Google Bard <laughs> is learning from, <laughs> let's say, Microsoft. Okay, anyway. And yeah, yeah, like it's it's so funny to see mm-hmm. that if if the bots in future can also have that community, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because learning from community or learning from each other or passing those signals, right? Mm-hmm. Um, are so important uh, which which like i think we we discussed earlier uh, in in the last podcast as well that we all are connected at some point right like uh, even for larger universe we can be a, a quantum universe right uh, yeah <laughs> um, i i i saw a definition of innovation like you have to maximize utility and you need to decrease the cost Right. So if you if you decrease the cost as much as possible and if you maximize the utility for the human species as much as possible, you say that it's it's a great innovation. So if I if I see those eras, right, uh, Mm -hmm. like Ramayana, like you can communicate even without mobile phones, right, uh, with each other. Uh, And I think that kind of innovation I, I don't know if that was existing at that point of time, but it's like no cost, right? I don't need to pay mm-hmm. any cost, but it's just uh, the signals through which I can communicate with someone without yeah. uh, anything, right? Um, yeah, so it, exactly. And I, again, it goes back to those sensory organs uh, conversation that we had. Uh, animals can do that. Like there are certain animals can that can see in ultraviolet, right? I think... Uh, bees can see in ultraviolet right right yeah. owls can see in infrared lights so basically uh, i mean it's just about like how your senses are developed like uh, and then how, that basically defines how you can communicate it's not always like you need and then uh, machines are the, machines are just, two yeah. plants are communicating without any thing right like yeah that's so fascinating the roots <laughs> connection yeah. might they might uh, you know connect with each other yeah again so machines are nothing but our expansion of ourselves right we don't see the universe as it is we only perceive the reality that our brains can process right so we can, let's say we cannot see ultraviolet lights or we cannot see other spectrums of light but the machine we can build machines that can do that using those uh, those machines we can now predict like what is an atmospheric configuration on venus even though we are not there we can see that through the electromagnetic spectrum that we get right so i think enhancing your uh, abilities is what these machines are doing and uh, you can never uh, i don't know like we cannot we cannot confirm that those kind of machines existed at that time yeah but the very fact that the, the imagination or like the person who wrote that if it is a fact or an imagination you don't know but the fact that those people were able to even write about those things gives us an uh, you know idea about like how uh, you know they were definitely intelligent people right like yeah. they they had the ability to think and perceive and write those uh, things so yeah i mean there's no yeah, doubt i mean yeah. there might be uh, there might be certain things that got lost in history and i think human history uh, it's like what we know of is just a very small fraction. Like you don't, we don't, we have no idea what happened. But thousand, we so the recorded history is very recent. Like the things yeah. that we started recording is exactly. very recent. A lot of history is is basically uh, lost. And I, I think there was another. There's a field. If you, I think you can look into that. It's called crypto mythology or something. It's by it's basically understanding those. You know, reading those, let's say if a particular book was written in a certain time period, you can read those books. And from that reading, we kind of understand the type of society was there at that time, right? Yeah. So so these things, we, we are using these indirect methods because there is no way we can understand what happened. So this this there can be a debate of whether those yeah. machines existed at that time or not, but you can never know. So maybe, uh, Sheil, a last question here, right? And... It's, mm-hmm. it's funny that we have discussed intelligence so much now. The last question is, do you still feel that everything is programmed in this universe? Even our intelligence, even our decisions, even having the chat bot like chat GPT is programmed. Like everything 
is programmed and we still feel we are putting our intelligence into function uh, as humans but we are kind of living in a simulation uh, and it's very fascinating topic because many of the scientists like many of the scientists researchers they try to uh, just take this hypothesis and they try to do some study uh, but i i just want to understand what what are your views do you do you think everything is programmed and even uh, the, what we feel is intelligence is basically something which is programmed yeah that's a very difficult question and i might not be the most uh, qualified pa- person to answer this but i can still give my two cents on this uh, so what i believe is right like uh, you can believe whatever you think is logical to you but basically what i believe is you know the world runs on uh, quantum mechanics right like quant, quant this is a quantum universe right uh, and this and based on quantum mechanics right like everything is existing as of now like everything like all the possible realities they exist together at the same time or every time like every decision you make there are multiple probabilities that you will be making other decisions and those all decisions exist at the same time so i don't know whether it is programmed or not but this is something that uh, you know is not very simple and it is very complicated to understand uh by programming if you mean that everything is already predefined so there is always going to be if you if you can imagine a particular type of a, a outcome of the universe let's say the, let's say you know so a big for, crunch happens yeah like, i can you know, give you an example yeah. right so for example when i was when i cleared uh, my school i want mm-hmm. to enter into an engineering college right and then i mm-hmm. have multiple options i took one option maybe in other universes i took all the possible options which i had yes. right and then all those universes had like i was there in all those universes and living my life with those probabilities and those actions but in this universe yeah. i have taken that subject and i i'm living my life as per yeah. right so and every all, decision all those, yeah. has number of probabilities and every mm-hmm. decision is making number of universes so if i see and that's what people argue right that any which ways you will take one decision right so any which ways you will be part of that one universe uh, but you don't yes. know if there are multiple universes uh, where other decisions are being taken right yeah exactly and that's the crazy part right like it's like uh, like for example in this particular room right like there are different radio frequencies they all exist together but if i turn on a radio and i sync it to a particular you know frequency i might listen to one radio station but that doesn't mean that other radio stations don't exist in my room i have all those frequencies it's just that my machine is programmed to only one frequency so i think that's what uh, the quantum universe uh, you know quantum Uh, theory says that you know everything exists together and then again going back to the fact that is it programmed so program means like there is a possible outcome that you can define right so anything that you can define in your mind like okay like like you know angad suddenly uh, gained a huge uh, popularity became uh, let's say a very great political leader and then ultimately started uh, became like a global leader that possibility can also exist right based on every probability that you say everything that you think as a possible outcome and will you exist. imagine is a kind yeah. of a universe there right yeah and if it is programmed so let's take it like like hypothesis testing as we have it in statistics right let's let's say if pro, if the uh, if the whole universe is programmed let's take as our null hypothesis and then we'll try to prove or disprove it so if the universe is already programmed then just imagine the amount of computing that is going <laughs> in the back end because the universe first of all there are we already know there is multi like according to uh, you know 
quantum theory there are we live in a multiverse there are multiple universes existing together they might be overlapping they might not be overlapping but just to just think about our universe our milky way galaxy is millions of light years wide right and then uh, within this uh, universe like uh, and then there are so many billions of galaxies out there so just imagine the stretch of the space yep. with and whatever you see is called observable universe and that's just 5% of the universe 95% of the universe is we cannot see it you know but it still exists we know that because we can uh, observe its impact it's basically called dark energy or dark uh, yeah. uh, dark matter right yeah. so these are already there so just imagine just one universe there is so much going on and then we're talking about multiple uh, parallel universes so it's crazy if it is if it is if it exists then there is like a super uh, intelligent capable species out there which has created this whole universe and and it might be that we are let's say in a laboratory of a alien species that created accidentally created this universe it can be anything yeah yeah i think that's that's great or very fascinating to think so with this i think that's the right point to end our discussion and i would yep. again like i think it was a superb discussion i would like to thank you again shield for your valuable time uh yep in defining intelligence yep sure thank you angad it was definitely great talking to you always fun to uh, discuss on these topics and yeah thank you